It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're having a good week so far, and I'm looking forward to being with you in person this coming Lord's Day morning, if the Lord wills. And this past Sunday, of course, we got together in one service for the first time in a long time. I believe we had 59 people come to worship on Sunday. And with only 59, to me at least, it felt absolutely packed. And it's hard to imagine that we used to have quite a few more than this fit in the building on a regular basis. Uh, this su coming Sunday, we'll once again meet for Bible class at 9.30. I believe we're looking at the qualifications for deacons in 1 Timothy 3, kind of a carryover from last week's discussion on elders. And then we'll continue our study of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 at the worship assembly at 10.30 a.m. Uh, please remember when you show up on Sunday, even if it looks like there are seats that are open, when you get there early, uh, try to make every effort to move on up to the front. And I would invite you to just imagine being a guest and showing up at 1030 and having it look like it does in this picture. And uh, to me, at least, if I were to walk in at this point in the service, um, I would start thinking perhaps there is no room for me. It doesn't look like a whole lot of options there. So uh, no, no room for me to sit, at least without moving on to the front row myself as a guest. So I'm just saying, even if the seats in the back are open when you get there early at nine or whenever you get there, um, please go ahead and do that awkward thing of going right up to the very front pew if you're able and willing to do that. And uh, please also remember we do have a live stream monitor down in the lower level. Uh, we had three people take advantage of that this past week, uh, but we do hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 9.30 and then also at 10.30. So 9.30 class, 10.30 worship. Before we get to our study tonight, I want to give you just a brief update as to what I've been up to over the past couple days. It is election season again, and once again, I got the call from the Dane County Clerk to do some ballot testing for the upcoming April election. So I spent Monday and part of Tuesday in what I would describe as a uh, bunker, kind of a, a windowless room. I guess technically it did have a window. The window looked out on another office, so <laughs> it was kind of the interior of the city county, city county building, and we were there for about a day and a half testing every possible ballot ballot combination for every voting machine in all of Dane County. So it was a neat experience, just kind of neat to see how that goes down. Um, I know static electricity can do some terrible things in this world, but I wanted to show you what it was doing for me this week. So the printouts would kind of shoot out the slot there on the left up or corner there of the machine and they would just stick to the wall and uh, I got a kick out of that. Kind of made it easier for me at least, didn't have to bend over to get those. Um, but anyway, they just kind of stuck there. So we would fire up the machine with the uh, little thumb drive for the polling place. We would run the ballots through, crouch down, retrieve the ballots from the bottom of the machine, uh, double check that everything the machine counted was actually matching the votes that were cast, and then repeat over and over and over again. And so I guess I've done hundreds of squats over the past couple days, and I'm thankful for the uh, distraction of being able to do that and serve the county in that way. And I think for the opportunity to interact with some new and interesting people here in Dane County. Um, due to the car situation in our home right now, I did uh, take the city bus downtown uh, Monday and Tuesday, Monday in the snow, Tuesday in the sun. It was like two different planets. Uh, but we live in a beautiful city, and I did, though, encounter a number of homeless people uh, sleeping in doorways around the square as I made my way from the bus stop to the city county building. And I know it's easy for us to miss this. I don't see it every day near where I live on the far southwest side of Madison. Uh, but I'm just saying that we do have a number of homeless men and women living on the streets here in Madison right now. So let's just not forget this. Let's not be numb to it. And obviously we can be praying about that. We can also be thinking of ways to help and then we could just jump in as we find those opportunities. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our brief series of lessons on prophecy in the Bible. So we're just hitting the highlights. We're doing an overview of prophecy kind of as a buffer between the book of Acts and the book of Genesis where we're heading in a few weeks here and to help us keep on track to give us a sense of direction and purpose and progress we're putting a rough outline on the left side of the screen starting with the basics so a definition of prophecy some principles of prophecy then moving on to some examples of various prophecies concerning nations individuals God's kingdom and then ending with some prophecies concerning Jesus himself we started by describing a prophet as someone who's basically a spokesperson, uh, always speaking on God's behalf, sometimes but not always foretelling the future. And then we looked at a chart listing all of the prophets in the Bible. You may remember I was surprised by the number of prophets. Uh, this is available on the church website if you want to look into this further. Um, in our study, we've been focusing on predictive prophecy, so not just speaking on God's behalf, but specifically 
the kind of speaking on God's behalf where a person does foretell the future in some way. And for this, we noted some principles of prophecy. These are just summarized here. If you want to know more, feel free to go back and review those lessons on YouTube or also on the phone server, if that's the way you've been joining us. We then moved into a, a study of some examples of predictive prophecy, starting with some national prophecies. We focused in on Egypt and then Rome but especially on Babylon and the Babylonian captivity as it was predicted and then the aftermath of that uh, captivity as Babylon itself was punished for going overboard with that. Uh, last week, we looked at some examples of personal prophecies being made and fulfilled. So the one to Abraham concerning the birth of Isaac, we just noted some similarities between those uh, prophecies and the predictions made concerning the births of Samson, Samuel, and John. We looked at Joseph's dreams and his interpretations of several dreams, all involving foretelling the future. We looked at Jacob blessing his children. We looked at the fall of Jericho and the prophecy made against whoever might someday decide to rebuild it. And then we closed last week with two prophecies from Agabus, as he is found in the book of Acts a couple times. Well, tonight we move on to look at some prophecies concerning the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And by way of brief introduction, I want to give just a few short passages to show that the church and the kingdom are, are terms that can often be used interchangeably. In the Old Testament, the word we normally translate as kingdom comes from a word referring to kingdom, sovereignty, dominion, or reign. So God's kingdom then is basically God's rule on this earth. And there are a few passages that seem to refer to God's kingdom uh, still coming in the next life in some sense, but most passages refer to it happening here. And I want to show that a number of passages in the Old Testament and the Gospel accounts prior to Acts 2 uh, point to the kingdom coming at some point in the future. And then there are several passages after Acts 2 referring to the kingdom existing in the present or pointing back to the past as uh, something that has already been established. And so we've got uh, those in the old pointing forward. We've got some after X2 pointing back into the past. So I'm going to try to illustrate this the very best that I can. You know I'm not the illustrator, but uh, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Uh, there, there are dozens of passages that we could uh, add in here. But I want to start by giving a few in a way that I can fit them on the screen just to illustrate something of a, of a timeline. And we won't take the time to go into all of this in depth, looking all, at all of these verses in context. But I want to just note that before Acts 2, the references to the kingdom refer to it coming in the future. And then the references generally after Acts 2 refer back to the kingdom already existing in the presence or having been established in the past. So let's start with the brief reference in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And uh, this is a, a prophecy made by God to King David. In 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13, God is speaking through Nathan the prophet. That's the same Nathan who confronted David concerning his sin with Bathsheba. And the context is David wants to build God a temple in Jerusalem. So he's just brought the ark to the city, or he's getting ready to do that. They've just come through that whole situation with Uzzah being struck dead for touching the ark and all that. And, and David just needs some reassurance. So that really shakes him. So through Nathan, God says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And he continues on from there. There are some other verses in this chapter we could consider. But I think the point here is, even though David was currently ruling in a literal kingdom on this earth, uh, this prophecy is made indicating that in some sense, God would be establishing his kingdom at some point in the future. And so this kingdom that God is referring to in this prophecy, in at least some sense, was still to come. So David is ruling now, but there is something about his kingdom, the kingdom of David, the kingdom of God, that was still coming in the future. Now, there are other passages like this in the Old Testament, but for just a, a taste I want us to kind of fast forward over to the New Testament, to the ministry of John the Immerser, John the Baptist, as he was sometimes known. This is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, where John says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So again here, we are very close to the kingdom actually being established. We're now in the 
uh, late 20s of the first century AD. So John is saying not only is the kingdom still coming in the future, but at this moment, uh, it is at hand. In other words, it is right around the corner. It is in the very near future. And uh, we remember also Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 4, um, 17. Uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so Jesus and John then both taught the establishment of the kingdom is right around the corner. It was at hand or near. And then I've also put on this uh, little scripture here from Mark 9, verse 1. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So, I mean, this is really right around the corner. Some of you standing here today, Jesus says to those who are listening to him, uh, you will see this actually happen. Um, I think there may be another one here. Okay, this is Acts chapter 1, verses uh, 7 and 8. Uh, Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. So again, Acts 1, 7 through 8. And uh, this is something that is coming right around the corner. So then we have the, the church established in Acts chapter 2, and we'll get back to that in just a moment. But for the most part, a vast majority of those passages referring to the kingdom um, before Acts chapter 2, they all refer to it coming in the future. Those refer to it uh, after, refer to it as something that has already uh, happened, something already in existence. And for the example here, let's go over to Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where Paul praises God the Father. He says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so there we have this reference to the kingdom as something uh, that we have been transferred into, the past tense. Uh, this is not something that's still coming at the time Paul wrote these words, but there is a sense in which we as God's people are already in the kingdom of God at this point. And so in the kingdom, we have redemption. In the kingdom, we have the forgiveness of the sins that we've committed in the past. So this is something that we're experiencing right now. So I hope this makes sense just as something of a big picture outline. The kingdom is prophesied as coming in the future in the Old Testament times. Uh, and in the very near future in the gospel accounts, those verses that we've looked at here tonight already. And then after Acts 2, it is described as currently existing. It is something that we are, uh, that we have been transferred into. It is something that we are in right now. So those verses are looking back. Uh, at the establishment of the kingdom as something that has already happened in the past. Uh, however, I would point out that there are uh, just uh, some exceptions, just a, a small handful of exceptions to this. Uh, some people will dogmatically teach the kingdom and the church are always the same, that they are synonymous in every possible way. Uh, we do need to be honest with this, and I think we do need to note just a few passages that do present some challenges to this way of thinking. Uh, one of these is 2 Timothy 4.18, where at the end of his life, Paul looks to his own future and he says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So yes, Paul already is in God's kingdom, the church, and the fact that he's already been saved. Uh, but the reference here is to God's heavenly kingdom, which for Paul obviously was still coming in the future. It was something that he was looking forward to, something that he had not yet experienced. The next reference comes from Peter. This is 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, where Peter says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble for in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. So again, writing to Christians who are already in God's kingdom, the church, uh, Peter, I think, very clearly says here, he refers to God's eternal kingdom as something that is still coming in the future, at least for these people at this moment. And I share these to emphasize that, generally speaking, yes, the kingdom and the church are the same. However, there are a small handful of passages that indicate that in some sense, God's kingdom is still coming. And I believe these would be references to our eternal reward in heaven. So let's just be aware of that as we study. Um, there are any number of passages we could consider concerning the coming of God's kingdom, the church. But I'm going to focus in on, on the saying that's here on the screen. Hope, hopefully most of you can see that. Uh, years ago, I remember Brett Rutherford saying something along these lines. 
that Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Joel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts 2. And I've shared this off and on through the years a, a few times. And to me, that really made sense and made it easy to remember. And so, again, there are other passages about the kingdom outside of the chapter twos in the Old Testament. Uh, but these are the twos. These are, uh, these are the ones on this list. And this is what makes it easy to remember. So I just want to focus on some of these tonight. And if we're able to, we'll try to bring some in from outside sources. Uh, in many ways, this is just an overview again, but let's start with Psalm 2. And I know the headings are not inspired, but in my Bible at least, the heading on Psalm 2 is the reign of the Lord's anointed. The reign of the Lord's anointed. And remember, we're talking about God's kingdom tonight. So a kingdom is ruled by a king. And so this isn't necessarily a direct prophecy about the kingdom but in a way it is, in that Jesus is the head of his church. So let's see if that fits in here. So let's look at Psalm number two. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear down, or let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling, do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. I mean, obviously, if we were together, I could ask, you know, who is the Lord's anointed in this passage? And we might say that uh, David fits this description, any of God's uh, kings ruling over God's people might fit this description. But to me, this seems to go beyond an earthly kingdom. Notice in verse 6, we have a reference to God installing his king up on Zion, my holy mountain. Obviously, that is a reference specifically to Jerusalem. And we know David ruled as king before he ever got to Jerusalem. So this isn't really referring just to David. Uh, in verse 7, this king is referred to as being God's son which is very powerful. Notice in verse 8, the kingdom he reigns over is described as a worldwide kingdom. That, that goes beyond what Israel ever was. Uh, notice in verses 11 and 12, the whole earth is invited to worship the sun. So, I, you know, this passage itself, if we were to just isolate it, may not prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a prophecy concerning the church. But I think as we move forward, as we consider the other chapter twos from the Old Testament, I think we'll see that it fits what fits in quite well with the others. Uh, there is a king coming at some point in the future from the perspective of the author of this psalm. Uh, this king is described as God's son. His rule will begin from Jerusalem. It will extend throughout the entire earth, at which point he is worshipped by people from all nations. And really, no earthly king of Jerusalem ever fulfilled those requirements. So let's move on and let's continue with Isaiah 2. And so let's look at Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And this is a prophecy made by Isaiah uh, very roughly 700 plus years before the church is established. This is Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and it will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations, and will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Again, we're just doing the brief overview here, but let's notice this prophecy is about something that will happen in the last days. Uh, we know from Hebrews chapter 1, that the last days are another way of referring to the Christian age, basically any time from the, the time of Christ up until the Lord returns. 
So as to the timing of this kingdom being established, this would happen in the last days. Uh, as to the location, notice Isaiah is referring to Jerusalem as the mountain of the Lord. Uh, he then refers to many people streaming to this mountain. So uh, they came to Jerusalem for the purpose of learning. Obviously, in Acts 2, we do have people from all nations coming to Jerusalem for, for Pentecost. Uh, and these people are coming specifically to learn God's ways, which is predicted here. They're coming for a reason, which they certainly did in Acts 2. Then Isaiah in verse 3 also refers to God's law going forth from Zion. If you remember the law of Moses, it, it did not go forth from Jerusalem, did it? It went forth from Mount Sinai uh, with the Ten Commandments and all that. And so uh, I think this is clearly a reference to the new law, the new covenant, the gospel going forth from the city of Jerusalem, which it did in Acts chapter 2. Uh, in the last verse, we have this reference to swords being uh, hammered into plowshares and, and so on. In other words, this new kingdom, the church, it'll be a kingdom that will not wage war with physical weapons. As God's people today, we do not wage war against our enemies. If, if our congregation doesn't like something we see happening, um, we don't you know, organize an army to go take care of it. That's not the kind of kingdom that we are. We don't go to war with our enemies in the Lord's church. Um, as Jesus said right before his crucifixion, his kingdom is not of this world. And so his kingdom is spiritual. It is not physical. And all of this uh, certainly fits in with the church perfectly in every way. And again, there's so much more we could add to this. Other passages like the Christian armor, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6 and, and so on and so on. But I think we understand that this prophecy in Isaiah 2, like the one in Psalm 2, is a prophecy about God's kingdom, the church, being established. Uh, let's continue moving along the top of the screen there to Daniel chapter 2. Uh, it's a larger passage. There, I think there's some value in reading it just to give some uh, sense of context. And that'll save me from explaining a lot of it. I think we could probably read it faster than I could explain it. It happens during the Babylonian captivity we talked about a week or two ago. Uh, Daniel is in Babylon serving the king, and this first section is Daniel 2, 1 through 18. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldean spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time. Inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the king which... Uh, the thing which the king commands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except God's, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, for what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. 
Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So just to summarize here, the king is giving some, he's having some weird dreams. Uh, the magicians have no idea what's going on. He is demanding that they tell him not just the interpretation, but the dream itself. And so they're about to be executed for stalling and making stuff up. And I think that's a wise move on behalf of the king to uh, kind of cut through all that stuff that uh, that he's been given. And so Daniel steps in. So let's continue uh, looking at what happens next. This is in verses 19 through 30. Daniel 2, 19 through 30. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king." Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However... There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Well, basically, just to summarize, Daniel steps in, uh, ready to save the day by telling uh, the king his dream, interpreting it. But uh, uh, not only will he interpret the dream, he will tell the king what the dream actually was. You know, if somebody interprets my dreams, that's kind of cool. You know, I think this is what that means, this weird thing that you dreamed the other day or whatever. Uh, but Daniel is about to take it to a whole new level by telling the actual dream. So if you come in on Sunday and you tell me what I dreamed about on Saturday night, uh, that that is next level kind of prophecy, right? That, but that is what Daniel is doing here. So let's continue then by uh, looking at what happens next. This is verses 31 through 43. And I, I've left the man-made headings here. Usually I would cut those out, but I think the headings... Uh, help us understand what's going on a little bit. So Daniel 2, 31 through 43. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain, and it filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you than another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. 
Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, so it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. And so just to summarize, Daniel gives an overview of basically world history here from this point forward to the time of the Lord by summarizing a series of kingdoms, major kingdoms, like world superpowers, starting with Babylon itself, um, then continuing with the Medo-Persian and Greek empires, and then followed by the Roman Empire there at the end. And all of this, I know it's a kind of a, a long introduction, but all of this leads us to the prophecy about God's kingdom. So let's pick up tonight with uh, Daniel 2, and let's just look at verses 44 and 45. Daniel 2, 44 and 45, and this is where we come to the prophecy about God's kingdom. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So remember, with reference to the Roman Empire, that last kingdom, Daniel says, in the days of those kings, God will establish his own eternal kingdom, and this kingdom will outlive all other earthly kingdoms. So Daniel then, he tells the king what he has dreamed, and then he tells the king what that dream means. And this is where we learn that God's kingdom, as to the timing of it, it will be established during the days of the Roman Empire. That is fairly specific. And uh, the church being established in Acts 2, it, it certainly fits within that time frame. And again, a lot we could say about Daniel 2, a lot that we'll skip over here, but just by way of summary, it's something that we learn about the timing of it. So let's continue on by looking at Joel 2. So we're moving along on the top of the screen there. So Joel 2, let's look at verses 28 through 32. Joel 2, 28 through 32. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape." as the Lord said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. I just want to note that uh, the day of the Lord there, I should have set that aside like bold, middle, because I think that is one of the headings there. So uh, nothing that we need to, uh, I think that was not in the text itself. I'd have to look that up in an actual copy of the Bible, but I am almost certain that's the case. Uh, but we'll get back to some of this in just a moment. But what makes this especially relevant in this discussion is the fact that Peter actually quotes this passage directly in Acts chapter 2. So it doesn't get any more clear than this, if that makes sense. I mean, he takes this and he quotes it and he says, this is uh, this is what Joel was talking about. And so he's very specific with that. So let's head over to Acts 2. And uh, this is at the beginning of Peter's sermon over in Acts chapter 2. So this is the day of Pentecost, um, right after like seven weeks after the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. So Acts 2, let's just start in verse 14. We won't even read all this because it, it's a quote from what we just read. Uh, Acts 2, 14 and following, But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, 
and so on. And then he continues on from there. And again, we won't read all of that again. But I really want us to focus in on what Peter says there, I think in, uh, yeah, in verse 16. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. In other words, Peter specifically says that the events of Acts 2, they are the direct fulfillment of Joel's prophecy uh, several hundred years earlier. And then he goes on to quote extensively from the book of Joel. Obviously, there is some figurative language here. And uh, we have studied that passage when we just studied this in our study of Acts a few months ago. So we won't dig into the, uh, the figurative language part of that. If you want to, you can go back and, and study that on your own. Um, but I'm just saying the point here is the prophecy from Joel 2 uh, was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. So again, there are other prophecies about the church that we could obviously study tonight, uh, but we focused on the fact that uh, Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, and Joel 2 are all fulfilled in Acts 2. So for me, that makes it very easy to remember. I hope that helps you as well. If you want to learn more, I would highly recommend heading over to christiancourier.com, uh, doing a search for a kingdom and prophecy, uh, maybe even search for the book of Daniel. I've done all that in preparing for this lesson, among other sources, but uh, Wayne Jackson, I have loved that man, and uh, does just has a way with words, simplifying some of these complex passages very accurately, but uh, in a way that we can understand. So uh, he's got some great material on all of this. So just christiancourier.com, search for prophecy, Daniel, kingdom, that kind of thing. And he's got a number of articles on there that are, are very appropriate. Uh, if the Lord wills, we hope to continue this next Wednesday by looking at the prophecy specifically about Jesus. So we'll be looking at Jesus next Wednesday, if the Lord wills. And I want to see you this coming Sunday at 930 for class. Come prepared by reading again 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then be prepared for worship as well at 1030. Feel free to read ahead looking again at Acts or at, at, uh, rather um, uh, Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, I really enjoyed the singing this past Sunday. I don't know about you. It had been too long and, and just uh, being able to sing that many songs all at once. Just a, a wonderful experience. So I uh, hope to see you this coming Lord's Day morning, 930 for class, 1030 for worship. Uh, as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not yet been done. You have always known the future, and tonight we're thankful that you have revealed bits and pieces of it in Scripture in a way that helps prove who you are, that you are a God who truly deserves our worship and our praise. Thank you, Father, for your perfect word. Tonight, we're also thankful for your kingdom, the church. We're thankful for those prophecies looking forward to the establishment of your kingdom on this earth. And we're thankful that you have made us a part of it by forgiving our sins. Tonight, we ask a special blessing on Charles as he mourns the death of his brother, Mark. We pray that you will give him peace, that you would comfort him during this very difficult time. Lord, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our King. Amen.